pleased to have Luis Caffarelli from the University of Texas, who's been here for a couple of months and going, unfortunately going back very soon. Uh, tell us about some mathematical issues related to some of these permeable membranes. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, so basically, I will talk first of about as a, an old simple model due to Duvaux and Lyons that gives rise to a mathematical problem that concerns sort of a boundary obstacle or a, what is called a thin obstacle. And I will talk about more or less give an idea of what is the theorems you get, the regularity of solutions and free boundaries. These are basically two pieces of work with one with Atanasopoulos and Sals and the other with, uh, with uh, Sals and Silvestre, uh, Luis. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, I, I'm going to discuss a sort of an alternate model. In other words, I'm going to discuss uh, when you think of a membrane as just having the semi-permeable membrane consists of a, a bunch of channels, like you can take perforations, let's say, or channels that allow fluids to go through and discuss how is this related to this one, you know, the, the, the associated sort of homogenization problem. Uh, so the problem more or less can be described the following way. You have uh, some, uh, uh, say some domain D and uh, uh, that is uh, whose boundary is a semi-permeable membrane. And that means the following, that means that you have some concentration of a salt or something else uh, outside of the cell and inside of the, as in outside or inside of the domain. And uh, as long as the concentration along the, along the membrane is uh, bigger inside than outside, the salt cannot go out. Uh, when the concentration tends to fall below the the, the outside concentration, then there is outside flow from outside to inside. In other words, the concentration, the flow can compensate the con lower, smaller concentration inside and outside because the membranes allows for flow from outside to inside, but does not allow flow from uh, inside to outside. So as long as the concentration is bigger inside, nothing will flow. Okay, the dynamics is something I'm, I'm asking my students to really work hard on it, see if they can say something. <laughs> so, it's frozen. so in principle, this is a stationary problem, uh, time, uh, a time invariant, just just the stationary configuration. Let's say, okay. So in other words, when the concentration inside is bigger than outside, you have no flow. So basically here you have a zero uh, Neumann data, okay? And when the concentration inside tries to fall below, uh, then uh, there is flow. So here you have positive exterior normal derivative. Usually the flow uh, goes against the gradient of a concentration from higher to lower concentration. Okay, so that the flow, the fact that flows in implies that the gradient of a concentration going outwards has to be positive. And so, uh, uh, Lyon and Dubois, uh, they have a book called The Equations, uh, Les Equations de la Mathematique et la Physique. I think it was something like that. Uh, where they present a bunch of problems related to semi of membranes, of which this is the simplest one. If you read their book, then they consider thick membranes, evolution problems, uh, uh, different, uh, different uh, sort of uh, stabilization rates across the membrane and inside. So maybe you can have some type of an elliptic equation inside and an evolution equation on the boundary or the other way around. So it's a very interesting. Uh, a series of problems about which uh, they just do sort of uh, uh, existence in. They are trying to enlarge the membrane or something. Like that. So, uh, so it's a very interesting couple of chapters of which they basically prove existence in the appropriate uh, Hilbert space. So it's a very there are many interesting problems if you want to say something more concrete about that. Uh, 
So, so if you want to uh, write the problem variationally, if you write it as what would be an obstacle problem along the boundary. In other words, you say, OK, inside the domain, I want to minimize the integral of gradient u squared plus some source term or consumption term f of u, OK? with the constraint that along the edge of the membrane, uh, the concentration u is going to be bigger or equal than the external concentration. Okay? And so if you do that, you automatically get this uh, compatibility con these two conditions. The, the complementarity conditions are called in the <coughs> literature, right? which is as long as u is bigger than 0, you can perturb freely the problem. And if you can perturb freely the boundary problems of a variational integral, then what you get is Neumann condition, okay? If you don't prescribe. Along the <laughs> part of uh, the boundary of D where you coincide with U0, you can only perturb upwards. In other words, you can only increase U, and that corresponds to positive exterior normal, okay? So, autom so you get uh, variationally, you get the, the solution you are uh, uh, expecting. Uh, uh, if f is equal to zero, then the internal energy of, uh, of u, we can write it as sort of a, let's, let's assume f equal to zero for simplicity, you can write the internal energy as a boundary energy, okay? Because the integral of gradient u squared, for this, the solution would be harmonic, so the integral of gradient u squared is equal to the integral of u, u nu, right? Which is a, uh, the same as half a derivative in L2, right? Here we have one, and here we have one half. This is a bi we have I mean, zero and one. And this is a symmetric bilinear form for harmonic functions, because this is equal to this. And so it corresponds to, uh, to half a derivative in L2. OK, so one could say uh, at this moment, OK, let's forget the inside, right? And let's just think of this problem in along the boundary of the domain, in other words, uh, to solve the problem inside to compute the energy and come back outside is like uh, a little bit unnecessary. So uh, let me point out that uh, there, are, uh, there are several different uh, problems in the literature that are mathematically similar to this one. The most classic one is called the Signorini problem. It's a linearization of an elastic body sitting on a plane have an elastic body sitting on a plane, and this linearization, you, are, you look at the height of the body when it separates from the plane. And so uh, in the part where uh, it sticks to the plane, the height is zero, and there is some uh, pressure going on. So it's like uh, when you linearize the problem, it's u is zero, u nu has a sign. And in the times where it's free, u is positive, and then the, the edge of the elastic body is in equilibrium, so u nu equal to zero. Uh, it's, uh, also, there are uh, problems of uh, temperature control. This is you have a wall and you want to optimize sort of insulation. So you have to decide uh, how to put insulation. You have a similar mathematical problem. And, uh, and the third one is, uh, is, uh, is uh, an American option where you have a jump process. In that case, instead of getting the Laplacian to the one half, you get a more generally levy process. Okay. Uh, and then there is one nice one, which is, uh, it was in the early times of variational inequalities that people did a lot of work. Nietzsche had this uh, Giacometti brother, uh, a hat for Giacometti brother's paper. Apparently Giacometti has these sculptures where the heads are very skinny. Uh, so, uh, and it is a membrane over a wire. So I'm, let me talk in these terms because this is very nice to visualize. OK, so let me just say uh, what I meant uh, before, that the, the you, you have uh, one of the, uh, one of the um, let me say first about uh, the American option. Uh, in general, you can think of the obstacle problem the following way. When you, have, when you want to have the standard Laplacian, you can think of the obstacle problem as a baby model for the following game. You start at the point x0, and you start to move uh, uh, Continue with the continuous random walk, and you are playing the game where you say, uh, OK, I start to move at x0. I move along with the random walk. And at any moment, uh, I have the right to say I stop playing. 
And the moment I say that stop playing, you have to pay me uh, the value of the obstacle, phi of x at that point. Okay. Uh, if I hit the boundary, the game is over and I don't get anything. Uh, so uh <coughs> if we play that game, then uh, there is an, uh, if you want to know what is the optimal strat strategy to play the game, uh, that means the, the rule, uh, then you uh, basically have to find, since the process is continuous, you have to find when are you going to stop. Okay, and so th the rule is uh, is the following: uh, you consider the, the 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 amount you earn when you stop the phi of x. You consider it your obstacle, and you solve the harmonic function that vanishes on the boundary of a set. The least superharmonic, the solution of the obstacle problem, the least superharmonic, which is above the obstacle and vanishes on the boundary of a set. Okay, and so what you get is uh, your obstacle phi and you stick somewhere to five and in that region you have to stop and uh, when you are outside you have to keep playing. Okay, and so the value of u in that case gives you the expected amount you are going to win with this strategy. Okay, if, uh, if you have a, a jump process then you can play the same game Right, uh, and uh, uh, you can play the same game. Uh, you, whenever you jump out, now you don't just uh, hit the boundary to go out. You jump above the boundary with uh, probability one, and so whenever you jump somewhere outside, you get zero. So you put zero boundary values everywhere. Okay, and then you have the same problem. In other words, you have to take the smallest super solution of the corresponding diffusion process, corresponding diffusion process, you have the smallest super solution of the corresponding diffusion process above phi. Okay? So it's a solution of an obstacle problem with a fractional diffusion. And what we treat with, uh, with Sandro and Luis Silvestre is the, because if you want regularity, the k has to be nice. You cannot expect regularity just with any k. And so what we treat is the simplest case of all, which is the case where k is a fractional power of the Laplacian. Okay. So mathematically, the problems are basically all the same. I can't find this noise. It seems to be coming it. from upstairs. Did you go upstairs? upstairs? <laughs> it's okay. No, I get up and go. It's okay, it's okay. But I mean, it's, uh, let's not worry. Okay, so to understand the problem, the nicest thing is to look at what was called the thin obstacle problem at the time of, uh, of variational inequalities, which is an obstacle problem, but where your obstacle is a thin obstacle. Instead of being a thick RN obstacle, is, for instance, a wire. Okay? And so uh, there are, uh, uh, there are two, two ways to present these problems, and sometimes it's nicer to look at one of them, and sometimes it's nicer to look at the other one to understand what's going on. Uh, so, for instance, uh, you can present a local version of this problem where you don't have to worry about infinity so much. And it's the following, right? You are given a wire and a membrane, and you, uh, have, a, and you have here a, or a, another wire or a solid vertical piece of plane, whatever you prefer. And you, uh, if you have the wire high, very high, then the membrane will not see this wire. We don't want to see this obstacle. And therefore, you will have... Uh, zero mean curvature, or if you linearize zero Laplacian, okay? And if I start to lower the membrane, at some moment it's going to hit the wire, and therefore uh, the, the, this, uh, this, uh, this wire will become an obstacle to the membrane, okay? And so in the parts where the membrane is free, right, if the, if the configuration is symmetric, for instance, in the parts where the membrane is free, you will have zero normal derivative by symmetry, and in the part where the membrane touches the wire, you will have positive exterior normal derivative. So, in some sense, mathematically, this is exactly the same as the problem of the semi-permeable membranes that I said at the beginning. In other words, you have these uh, complementarity conditions uh, that says, uh, you know, sort of Hamilton-Jacobi conditions that says, uh, um, how do you want to say, uh, uh, 
Uh, u bigger than zero, u nu bigger than zero, minimum of u and u nu equal to zero, okay, which will be, uh, in that, uh, at that time was called complementarity conditions, now would be Hamilton Jacobi. Or sometimes it's easier to think of the global problem. The global problem will be to uh, have some sort of uh, bounded uh, obstacle and let the solution go to zero at infinity. In other words, uh, and, uh, and sometimes it's easier to see uh, this problem. It's easier to see things in this configuration. Sometimes it's easier to see things in the other configuration. Uh, in this configuration, it's easy to see that this corresponds to uh, local to uh, to uh, to uh, fractional problem on the wire. In this configuration, there is no bound that is around, and so you can say, okay, what am I have to do here? I have to, uh, you know, what I have at the limit will be a function that has these compatibility conditions on this line and will be harmonic across outside. But if it is harmonic outside, what is outside, I just can compute by convolving the Poisson kernel with the trace here, right? So it is an enormous amount of unnecessary information. Just you even have a formula to write uh, u out here. Just, uh, you know, integrate against uh, y over x squared plus y squared, okay? So, uh, so really, one could try to think of this problem as a problem on, on this line. And if you do that, then is what I was mentioning before, that uh, you, your energy gradient u squared is simply the integral of u, u nu, which is the, if you do Fourier transform, is the h one half norm of a trace. So really, it becomes like an obstacle problem, but with a non-local integrand, you know, where you are minimizing. So you have a Hilbert space, which in this case is h one half, and uh, you are minimizing the h one half norm among all possible functions above your obstacle. So to understand a problem, the first thing you have to do is you have to take the simplest possible configuration and see what, what are the reasonable solutions, what, how those solutions look like. And so uh, uh, if you look at the possible configurations, right, if you look what happens, for instance, around this point, right, around this point, what you want to have is a function which is harmonic, right, is harmonic, okay, on both sides of the line, but it's also harmonic across here, because across there the two normal derivatives are zero, so one extends harmonically into the next one, okay? So, so what you will have is a harmonic function sort of except on a little slit. If you have a harmonic function except on a little slit, then it starts like the real part of c to the uh, c to the n plus one half. Okay. Now the one half c one half is and is not admissible because c one half goes up everywhere, right? Is uh, r to the one half cosine set over two, and that goes up everywhere. So it doesn't satisfy here the normal derivative negative, right? Here there is some sort of a special cancellation where the solution will go up in this direction but has to go down in this direction. Linears are not acceptable because they change signs, so the first, the first uh, admissible uh, solution, right, the first admissible asymptotic behavior will be r to the 3 half cosine 3 half theta, okay? And in fact, in two, dim in two dimensions, uh, uh, Hans Levy using a very nice argument on, on uh, of, of uh, complex analysis, and uh, Richardson showed that the solution is exactly C1, one, one half. Okay. So, so let me discuss a little bit then uh, what happens in Rn for a general uh, fractional uh, power of the Laplacian. Okay, so let's look at the obstacle problem. We look at the fractional power of the Laplacian, and then we can present the problem in two ways. As I said, it depends if you are come from calculus of variations or potential theory. If you look come from potential theory, the solution u to your obstacle problem will be, as I say sort of a Hamilton-Jacobi equation, right, is minus Laplacian to the alpha of u is positive, 
u is bigger than the obstacle and the minimum of minus Laplacian to the alpha of u and u minus 5 is 0. Okay? Minus Laplacian to the 1 half was uh, uh, exactly the exterior normal derivative in the discussion with the extension. Okay? Uh, uh, if you want to do calculus of variation, you said, okay, I minimize h1 half norm or h alpha norm uh, among all the functions u that are above the obstacle phi. Okay, and you can see that both, uh, if, if your operator is both non-divergence or divergence, then both, both and divergence, both solutions are the same. Okay, if operator is divergence, then this is the natural approach. If the operation is non-divergence, that this is, a, I feel like, a levy process, then the first one is a natural approach. Okay, so the first thing we managed to prove, this was sort of uh, standing there for many, many years, even for the Signorini problem, that is for the Laplacian to the one-half or the restriction to the boundary, was that the optimal regularity of the solution is exactly what you expect, that is C1 alpha. Uh, for alpha equal one half, I prove it with Atanasopoulos using some sort of uh, monotonicity formula. Uh, uh, Luis, in his thesis, developed a very nice theory, theory, and one of the many things he proved is that, or one of the consequences of that, is that the uh, solution is, uh, was almost optimal. You know, he proved Z1 beta, but had to give a little bit, couldn't reach the alpha because of a technicality. And then we took our revenge together, and we proved that indeed, for all alpha is uh, exactly C1 alpha. Uh, um, uh, what about the free boundary regularity? The free boundary regularity, so, so now you want, so let's say, let's uh, take a configuration in three dimensions, right? So you have... Uh, the boundary is two-dimensional, right? In the case that will be the case of the membrane. So the boundary is two-dimensional, and uh, and the free boundary is a curve, right? Uh, so you uh, you want to uh, to study what can you say about this curve? What can you say about stability of a problem? Okay. Oops. So basically, what, what one can prove, you know, if you look in two dimensions, right, then you can realize that basically there are two different types of configurations, right? One is the R to the 3 half. That, that, corresp you know, that corresponds to a segment and is the really non-degenerate, okay? And then you can have sort of a highly oscillator, more oscillatory solutions. That is, once you start with R to the 3 half, right, which is uh, uh, zero, uh, well, I'll, I'll make a picture in a, in a, in a little bit and ex explain this. But anyway, there is a, the stable profile, which is the first one, the non-degenerate one, which in, in the one-half case of the boundary corresponds to R to the three-half cosine three-half theta. Okay? Uh, then you can have like a quadratic polynomial. You can have x squared uh, in the x direction and minus y squared in the opposite direction that just touches at the point. And this is already a very unstable solution. You move a little bit, the, the, the data, the free boundary disappears. And then comes uh, uh, powers of r to the n plus 1 half with n larger and larger. And these are very oscillatory solutions. They go up and down in several quadrants. And also those are very unstable. In other words, any little perturbation you make, uh, you, uh, you have a problem. Okay, so what we can prove is that uh, Okay, well, so we can prove this, that at every free boundary point, you have this homogeneity. That is, that you have the first stable profile, then you have a quadratic polynomial, and then there is, and so there is, you, you realize that here there is sort of a jump in the, in the values of the uh, homogeneity. So you are going from 1 plus alpha to 2, and here to a, to a sigma strictly bigger than 2, okay? And this is the stable profile, and these are, these are unstable. Uh, so you, you can prove that this, um, this, um, this uh, property. And uh, 
If, if the point is stable, then you can prove that in a neighborhood of the point, uh, the free boundary, which in 3D was a curve, but this is an n-dimensional theorem, is a smooth surface. In other words, the phase transition from the, from the, from the contact set to the non-contact set is a smooth, stable surface. Okay, stable in the sense that if you change the data a little bit, the surface moves continuously. Okay, um, and this was uh, for alpha equal one half, which is the restriction of the of the Laplacian, would prove with uh, Atanasopoulos and Salsa, and with uh, with uh, Luis and Salsa, we re read the full theory for any power of alpha for more general obstacles. This was proven just for the zero obstacle problem. Uh, uh, for a general obstacle. So, uh, so let me say describe a little bit how 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 does uh, if use a few minutes to say how does this work in the. It's okay. You don't need to turn this off. So. Well, yeah, turn it off so I can use the central. OK, uh, so basically, uh, uh, the, the, I think the most important ingredient in the theory is the fact that you can use, in all of these cases, the uh, Almgren frequency formula. So it's, this is easy to realize uh, in the case when you do the Laplacian extension. So let me tell you, re recall for you, what the Almgren frequency formula says. Right, the Almgren sequence formula for a harmonic function in Rn says the following. So the, let's suppose that uh, U is harmonic in the ball of radius R, let's say, in a ball of radius 1. U of 0 is equal to 0, and so you look at the ratio between sort of the, uh, the average of the Dirichlet integral and the average of a function. Okay, so the average of the Dirichlet integral, oops, and then you want to put here the average of u on the boundary of the ball of radius r, okay? And you want to renormalize this properly so this quantity will be constant for harmonic polynomials, okay? So if I have a, uh, sorry, square. If I have a harmonic polynomial of degree k, right, this average is like uh, k uh, square, uh, k k squared, right, uh, r, and this is like r to the k, r to the 2k, and this is r to the, okay, <laughs> wonder how r to the 2k, and this is r to the 2k plus 1, so I need to put, so here, uh, when I take the gradient, I, I lose an r, so I need to put an r squared here, okay. So, uh, so you look at this quantity, J of R, this quantity is uh, constant on harmonic polynomials, right? And this quantity, you prove that it is monotone in R. Okay, so J of R. Monotone in R, right? And it is constant if and only if the function is a harmonic polynomial. It's, it's homogeneous, which in the case of harmonic functions means a harmonic polynomial. And J is constant <coughs> if R is U homogeneous. Okay. So this, in some sense, is a measure of how, so how the, if you start, shoot from, you have a harmonic function, you start at the origin and then shoot outwards, how the sort of the, the, the solution becomes more chaotic and more complex. In other words, you start at the origin, 
starts like a harmonic polynomial that is j of 0 for a harmonic function is uh, the degree of the polynomial. So it starts j of 0 is the degree of the polynomial. And as you go outward, sort of this, the oscillation increases. In other words, becomes more chaotic. Okay, So uh, for a harmonic polynomial, j of 0, 0 is the degree of uh, the polynomial of the harmonic polynomial harmonic polynomial the first harmonic polynomial so sort of the first spherical harmonic of u okay and so as you grow sort of the the, the sort of this quantity this this reflects how the, the, the polynomial is uh, more and more chaotic. An important consequence of this is that the sort of the, the degree of the first harmonic polynomial has some sort of semi-continuity, okay? Because uh, if the degree of the harmonic polynomial at the origin, the first harmonic polynomial at the origin is n, right? So uh, this implies Let me use this. this implies some semi-continuity of the degree of the first harmonic polynomial. Right? Because if at the origin the degree is n, Right? That means that you look at this quotient for a small r, for a very small r, so it's decreasing and gets very close to n, right? So, I mean, j of epsilon, right, is very close to n. But j of epsilon now is continuous if you move the point, you know. In other words, the value at the point is not continuous, but j of epsilon is. So if you move a little bit the point, j of epsilon will stay below n plus 1, right? Because it's less than n plus 1 half, for instance. So I move the point a little bit, and j of epsilon and x stays below n plus 1. So that means that if the degree of polynomial at the point is n, nearby is a smaller or equal than n. Okay. So now, now the next observation that the, that you can make is that our function, in some sense, is a multiple-valued harmonic function around the free boundary. Because if we look at our free boundary problem, right? Here I have u equal to zero. And here we have u bigger than 0, u nu equal to uh, 0. Okay. So if I come with a harmonic function around here, it extends in an even fashion on the other side. I keep turning around. When I come here, u is 0. It extends if I reflect the function by minus u. In other words, here it extends. If I make a circle around here, here is ext it extends just by itself. Here it extends by a negative reflection. So if I go around twice, I come back to the same function, right? And so basically, this is begging the question, does the Almgren monotonicity formula holds here? And the answer is yes. All you need is to have some regularity on the filament. In other words, you need to have, when you write the proof, you realize that you need to have just a little bit of control along the filament. And this, the control you need was an old paper of mine that proved that solution to the Signorini problem. I didn't prove the optimal regularity result, but I proved that was C1 alpha for some alpha. OK? So you get exactly for you, if you take a point, on the free boundary, you get exactly this monotonicity formula. You can think of this monotonicity formula 
in, uh, in, the, in one side of a line, or you can think it as a double-valued function, because since everything is a reflection of the other, at the end you get the same. The squares, the important thing is that the square doesn't see if you are reflecting negative or positive. The formula basically depends on the properties of u squared. You know, when you compute, you really never use u. You use always u squared. Okay? But now this says two things. This says then that if I take a solution of my, fiber, my free boundary problem, so, so what do you do next? You have this monotonicity formula, you make a sequence of dilations. In other words, you take larger and larger dilations, right? And then the corresponding j simply, if you dilate the function, that corresponds to evaluate the j closer to r equal to zero, right? So if you make larger and larger dilations, what you are doing is you are evaluating j closer and closer to the origin. But j is monotone. It has a limit at the origin. So basically, that says that when, if you do a sequence of dilation in the limit, you get a homogeneous solution of your free boundary problem. OK? And so, so you have an homogeneous solution of your free boundary problem, and this is exactly uh, the pro at least when you start, is the, the profiles that correspond to complex variables, right? The profiles that you discover when you do the first, uh, the first um, analysis on 2D, uh, when, when you do this heuristic analysis. Okay, so in the case one half, you realize that the, the blow up, so the blow up of the solutions will be, the first one will be like r to the 3 half cosine 3 half zeta with respect to a plane. In other words, the first one, that you discover is that you will have that your free boundary will be your contact set will be uh, a plane in the in the in the in the in the boundary of the domain, right? And here you will have the function r to the three half cosine three half theta in these coordinates and constant in the other direction. And the continuity of the semi-continuity of uh, of uh, j of 0, right, still holds. In other words, if at a point you have the stable configuration, then in a neighborhood of it you will have the stable configuration again. In other words, you will have to have the profile 3 half guarantees that you keep the same profile 3 half, that is a, the, the stable profile, in a neighborhood of the point. Okay? Uh, For the general, just yet, let me tell you, for the general, uh, for the general fractional power of the Laplacian, we use, uh, uh, we use uh, uh, an extension, right, that uh, we studied with, with, uh, with Luis, that, that says the following, that says that if you have a, a fractional harmonic function in Rn, so if you have a one-half harmonic function in Rn, uh, um, if you want to compute, let me put it like that. If you want to compute the fractional Laplacian, so what we saw up to now was that if you want to compute minus Laplacian to the one-half of u in Rn, right, what we can do is we can extend u to one more variable of x, y, and the fraction, the Laplacian to the one half was the non Dirichlet to Neumann problem. In other words, was the normal derivative of the harmonic extension. Okay? So uh, if you take any fraction of the Laplacian <coughs> in Rn, then you can always realize it as a Dirichlet to Neumann problem of a weighted extension. So what you do is you wait, you consider the extension. Instead of the harmonic extension in one of your variable, you consider an extension of the form divergence of y to the alpha gradient of u equal to 0. Okay? And the alpha is related to s in such a way that when you go s from 0 to 2, alpha goes from 1 to minus 1. Okay? Alpha equal to 1. If you look at any of the books of fluid dynamics, it's very popular, right? Because it is the equation for cylindrically symmetric harmonic functions. 
So it's not an extension anymore because you have a bounded cylindrical, a cylindrically symmetric harmonic function except on the axis. And let's say it's bounded, then it's harmonic across. So you cannot prescribe it there. Okay? Alpha minus 1 corresponds to the stream function of cylindrically symmetric functions. And then you can think of all the alphas in between as harmonic extensions into a fractional dimension. In other words, you can think of this as that you are extending your function to R n plus something, where the something goes between uh, one, 0 and 2. Okay? And if you take that point of view, then you can sort of recuperate all of the very delicate formulas of harmonic functions. Among them, the angry monotonicity formula. In other words, if you tell me how do you write the angry monotonicity formula for a fractional operator in this plane, right? I don't know how to do it. But you do the extension, you take the ball, and you do exactly the same computation, comes all weighted with y to the s or something like that, and you get the same monotonicity formula. Okay? And that's what allows us to treat all of the powers of the fractional Laplacian. You get the critical profiles that were computed by Luis, I think. <laughs> One day came very happy and said, this is the <laughs> yes. <laughs> so anyway, so you get the optimal profiles, and once you have the optimal profiles, then uh, the, and you have when you have that these are these optimal profiles which are uh, stable, and that have a nice linear free boundary for each one of them, then it is not hard to put together all the pieces of the obstacle theory of regularity of the free boundary of the obstacle problem. OK, so now let me talk about, uh, could, we, could we get again the, So this is something I did with Antoine Mellet, and is to say, let's look at uh, so so let's look at the problem sort of in the following way. So let's see if we can reconstruct the Duvalion's model as uh, as the effective equation of an homogenization process. What what you have is a membrane with sort of random holes. We kept them organized. At the end, I don't think you have to basically, it's a very general, when you end up understanding the problem, you can look at very general configurations. But to keep them organized, we said, OK, we have this uh, epsilon uh, square, let's say, epsilon reticulate, and you have here little holes. And uh, we ask, OK, so we have sort of, uh, we let the flow go through, only through the holes, OK? Uh, so again, it's a semi-permeable membrane. It cannot never can go. It never goes out, but it can go in freely through the holes. And then you ask, what should, how should the array of holes be? If you do a nice array of holes, how can you uh, reconstruct the? Um, can you reconstruct the Duvalion's model? Okay. Uh, So basically, the result is the following. Here, I did, we did it for all, for all fractional Laplacians, for all integral equations. But uh, let's, let's stick to alpha, alpha equal to, to 1 half. So the, the answer is if the holes, so, so you see that there are three situations. If the holes are uh, not too tiny, that is, if the diameter is sort of much bigger than epsilon, remember epsilon was the scale of the reticulates. If the holes are much bigger than epsilon to the n minus 2 alpha, so it would be n over n minus 1 for the, for the three dimensional, for the half lap, uh, for the Laplacian to the 1 half, then we recuperate the whole model. Okay? Uh, if the holes are critical, that is, are of the form n over n minus 2 alpha, then, are the size n minus 2 alpha, then we recuperate some intermediate equation. And if they are much smaller, it's like flow never 
went through. In other words, uh, they are too small to sort of uh, reach a stationary uh, situation where the flow works. So, so uh, let me tell you a little bit what we get, and then I'd like to explain you in the few remaining minutes uh, why. So, um, Okay, and maybe, uh, maybe let me go back to the blackboard and I will just show in the blackboard because I would like to refer to the classical uh, perforated domains theory. And uh, So this problem is, is like a version, this problem is like a version than some all, uh, it's like a, uh, in, the, in the periodic case, here we will treat the random case, but in the periodic case, there is a version of this problem for thick obstacles, okay, which is referred usually to, uh, uh, usually is, re is referred a lot as perforated domains. Okay, so let me tell you what happens with the thick obstacles and then I'll just uh, say a few words about the, the fractional obstacle. So, so with Antoine we treated both the classical case of the thick obstacle for sort of random perforations and the case of the, the the case of a fractional obstacle okay so for periodic arrays the, uh, this problem was treated many years ago i think the one by uh, there are a lot of papers one of the most classical one is a paper by Cironesco and Mura uh, and so basically we can describe the problem as follows so let's take in our a, in our in our tool let's take a thick obstacle Okay, and then you have your thick obstacle, but your thick obstacle is not really a thick obstacle. It's composed of, let's say, sort of a bunch of, it's like, a, like an hair, hairbrush. It's composed of, of uh, skinny uh, sticks, okay? And so you are not forcing your solution to be uh, above the full obstacle anymore, the solution has to be above the obstacle only in these little regions. Okay, so they wrote a paper that said a strange term, I think the title of the paper is like a strange term that comes from nowhere. Yes, yes. So Okay, so let me try to convince you that that is not so strange, the term, okay? <laughs> so the issue is the following. You have this, uh, this, have this uh, sort of, uh, uh, this obstacle composed of uh, skinny sticks, right? And you push a membrane down, and then you ask, you realize that there is some intermediate situation. In other words, for instance, if the sticks are all of order epsilon, of the same order than, than, the, than the scale of separation, you realize that the obstacle basically will not go down in the limit, will not go down too much because it's, it's too solid, the support of the sticks. If the sticks are really like needles, right? If you go to the critical case where they really becomes like needles, then the membrane will just go through, okay? And will go sit in the bottom of the obstacle. So, so you realize that there is an intermediate situation, which is the scale I referred to before, which for the obstacle is epsilon to the n minus n over two, where you can expect, where you can expect that uh, sort of the membrane will go down and sort of accommodate at some lower level. Okay. Now the membrane where it doesn't touch the obstacle is harmonic, right? So the Laplacian of this configuration here. Is zero, okay? If you make the ansatz that your configuration is going to be like a, some sort of a smooth function plus an oscillatory term, right? So you can try to locally, if you take a very tiny piece, right? Uh, epsilon is going to zero. So let's take a very tiny piece like delta or epsilon to the square root, uh, to the square root. This is a tiny piece, but this is a piece which is much larger than the scale of the oscillations, okay? So if you take a tiny piece which is much larger than the scale of the oscillations, right, what you will see is a, a lot of little oscillations, right, uh, but a lot of little oscillations sort of are moving along 
this surface, right? Now, this, this function has to be harmonic, OK? This function has to be harmonic. So there is a competition, because this function is to be harmonic, but sort of the envelope will have some different Laplacian, right? So let's think of u as consists of a, of a smooth function w, right? Plus sort of a corrector that is supposed plus this os this uh, oscillation in the in the in the oscillation of high something. Okay, so in fact let's look at the corrector that will correspond to oscillation of high one because if we can do that, then we can do any other one just by squeezing it a little bit. Okay, so you say okay I have this array of little holes right. I have this array of little holes that are coming down, right? And so there is a, this, this array forces on me some sort of compatibility condition. In other words, if I want to make the Laplacian of this array to be, since the Laplacian of, of whatever I have here uh, was uh, supposed to be smooth, when I look at an intermediate scale, the Laplacian of this surface is like constant to me, some constant, okay? So the Laplacian of this is constant, right? So I have to get some Lapla constant Laplacian for the, for the um, corrector outside of the little holes, OK? So the configuration of the little holes, right, is always is the, in sort of in homogenization, it's always this thing where you construct the corrector, and the corrector forces a condition, an equation, on the solution of the homogenized problem. So here, so you said, okay, I have these little holes, and if I want to continue it into a function with constant Laplacian, right, there is some sort of compatibility condition. So in other words, if I have the corrector of a high of order one, right, I will have to put here Laplacian. If I want to keep constant Laplacian of the corrector, uh, C I have will be some constant, A. Okay? And then you realize that here there is a competition on the level of this surface. Because if I have to put these two this together and the Laplacian has to give me zero, right? If I go down too much, you know, if the Laplacian of this is too negative, right, means that this surface is going up, right, I have to compensate it with a big dilation of the corrector. If, if I, the Laplacian of this is Minus 10,000, my corrector has to be 10,000, which means I have to take the basic corrector and make a 10,000 dilation. Okay? So there is an equilibrium in between, right, that says that basically the Laplacian of, of this surface, right, has to be proportional to the height of the corrector. But the height of the corrector is the deviation from the obstacle to U. And so it, it follows then that the homogenized problem in the region where it's below the obstacle, so it has to satisfy, so it has to satisfy an equation, the, the homogenized solution W has to satisfy an equation. Laplacian of W has to be proportional to the distance between the obstacle and the W, because it has to balance the multiple of the corrector. So Laplacian of W has to be uh, some constant uh, uh, W minus uh, negative part of W minus the obstacle. I don't want to put minus because, well, change the sign. I hate the convention that, that minus a function is positive. So minus the negative part. OK? So this should be the homogenized, the homogenized limit, OK? Now, uh, if you look at it, it's a sort of, it depends, it looks to, it seems to depend very much on the geometry of the little holes, OK? And so it is not clear how you should do to treat uh, a random process where the holes have a random configuration. But if you construct carefully the corrector, you realize OK, you here have a scale epsilon, right? And you realize that the hole, as I the formula I wrote before, in order to have something non-trivial, the hole has to be much, much smaller. It has to be epsilon to a power bigger than 1 in all of these cases. 
So you are constructing the corrector, which is a constant Laplacian, right, like this. And then you realize that if you take, again, an intermediate scale here, right, between epsilon and, let's say, epsilon to this uh, positive power, so you take a power in between, right, that will make this uh, scale much smaller than epsilon and much bigger than the size of the hole, then you realize that the function is almost harmonic. In that region, when the, when the function starts to shoot up, the constant takes a minor role to the growth of the function in this uh, skinny hole. Okay? And therefore, this is equivalent to a, an appropriate multiple. The solution in this range is equivalent to an appropriate multiple of the fundamental solution. In other words, is it the same, the, the corrector will be the same at this level, so outside here especially, right, and in an intermediate level over here, not too close to the hole, but still much smaller than the epsilon of the things, the corrector will be equivalent to putting a multiple of the fundamental solution, okay? What is the correct multiple? The correct multiple is the capacity of the hole. Because this is, what I'm saying here is that this looks like the potential, cap the capacitory potential of the hole, and it looks like a multiple of the delta. The multiple of the delta has to be the capacity. The capacity is, is the measure of the Laplacian on this hole, okay? So when you see that, you realize that you don't need too much to know too much about the geometry of the holes. All you need to know is that there is some averaging properties of the capacity, okay? And therefore, the appropriate, uh, the appropriate theorem should be that you have this random array of holes, and you want the capacities of those holes to average out. In other words, you put it in sort of in an ergodic framework where you have, uh, you know, uh, for each omega in a probability space, you have a different configuration, right? But they have the property that when you go to infinity, the capacities average up to a number, okay? Uh, for, the, for the thin obstacle, the, 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 um, among the things that we construct with uh, Luis is the notion of capacity. You can do the capacity for, for the fractional Laplacian, because you know the fundamental solution from the fractional Laplacian and so on. So it's basically the same, uh, it's, uh, the, the, the works as well with a, with a fractional, uh, with a, uh, an integral equation as with the thick Laplacian, the, the classical Laplacian. And the result is then that if you have these arrays of holes, then, uh, well, it doesn't matter. If you have these arrays of holes, then what you will have will be sort of a fractional permeability. In other words, what will happen is, schematically, what will happen is the following. You have the membrane. If the concentration inside the, the domain is bigger than the concentration is outside, uh, nothing will flow through. But the concentra if the concentration tries to go below the outside level, then <coughs> the outside concentration is not able to compensate fully if the holes are at this critical size. So if the holes are at this critical size, then what will happen is that here you have the external concentration, and inside the internal concentration will not reach in the stationary situation, the external value, in other words, will keep flowing, but will never manage to compensate. And the separation, that is the, the, the sort of the, the missing part, the, the lack, of, co the lack of, uh, of concentration, will be proportional to this height. In other words, the, the normal derivative here will be proportional to this height. So, so, OK, I guess this is all I wanted to say. Thank you very much.